Hello, everybody. Atma Namaste. Welcome to the session. So today we're going to be talking about uh, remaining part of prana a little bit and then moving on to chakras. Yes, force centers or energy centers. I hope you have your book ready so you can refer to it. <laughs> yes, so either the hard copy, uh, soft copy, online copy, whatever you have. All right. So let's start off with an invocation. Kindly close your eyes. I'm just going to share the screen for the sake of... Close your eyes, connect tongue to your palate, inhale and exhale, relax the body. Feel yourself in the presence of our teacher, Grand Master Chur, in the presence of Lord Maha Guruji Mele, in the presence of all the great teachers of Theosophy and the Supreme Being. Feel gratitude, respect and love to God and the teachers for all the priceless teachings we're about to receive. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother. We humbly invoke for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance, all through the session. To our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chur Koksui, to Lord Maha Guruji Meli, to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, to Lord Christ, to Lord Yehoshua Bar Miriam, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, to all the great teachers and the masters of theosophy, the great beings of knowledge, light and power, to our soul and divine self. We humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance, for your divine love and mercy, for your tremendous patience and the ability to help us absorb and assimilate the teachings given to us today. Bless us with greater clarity, greater and deeper understanding of these priceless teachings. We ask you to help us to make it part of our lives and use it to become better divine instruments. We thank you for this priceless opportunity and for these pearls of wisdom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. With gratitude, respect and love, we thank you. Feel the energy descending into you. Inhale and exhale. Spread it through entire being. Inhale, exhale, share it with your family, smile at them. Inhale and exhale, share it with everyone who's connected. Inhale the energy, exhale, share it with the whole globe. You may slowly open your eyes with a smile. Atma Namaste. Welcome again uh, to the Etheric Double. We are going to be ending chapter two in a while. And so we go ahead with that. Yeah, so we're going to move forward to uh, the PowerPoint to get to that point as well. So we remember we were talking about Prana and what we wanted to also talk about is the effect of um, both sunlight and during the day, during seasons, what is the effect of the prana around us, which is very vital for our life force, for our existence itself. Yes. And so that's what we're going to do. So I think we end it here. Yeah. Okay, so before we start, uh, I think we ended here where we spoke about the whole vitality of Biol and everything uh, and the details behind it. And uh, the principle of like attracts like and the formation of the whole um, Love you. Love you. Uh, just a quick correction on page 13. Making the food sheet. Okay, so if you look at page 13, uh, I just wanted to correct myself. Uh, it says, uh, but prana is the controlling energy which acts through the nerve centers. We spoke about that. And then it says making the food sheet obedient. All right. Um, and fashioning it for the purpose which the eye seated in the high intelligence demands. And we spoke about the whole concept of the eye, but the key words here is making the food sheet or the making, okay, let's simplify it. Making the physical body obedient, uh, obedient to what? And fashioning or designing it for a purpose which the soul uh, 
as a being of um, intelligence is going to utilize to evolve. So actually, what it is saying is saying um, the key word is obedient, which is used in the context of being fashioned. All right. So what they're saying is that the etheric body is the mold or pattern of the physical body, visible physical body. And the physical body uh, uh, is obedient or is shaped due to the way prana flows within the body. Okay, if it, so it says, uh, now if it flows in a deformed manner, then there'll be a corresponding defect or malfunction in the physical body. Okay, so it says um, from page 34 of uh, Miracles of Prana Healing, sorry I didn't write that. Um, it says it acts as a mold and visible part of the physical body. This is Master Chokokswi's book. Um, and it's because of the, um, so the physical body is actually molded on the energy body. So that's why Master is saying um, this allows the visible physical body to maintain its shape, form, and feature despite years of continuous metabolism. Uh, to be more exact, the visible physical body is molded after the energy body. If the energy body is defective, the visible physical body is defective. All right. So, so that's what uh, I just want to correct it because I didn't say that part. That's a very important part of the book. Um, it says pranic, uh, prana is the controlling energy which acts through the nerve centers or the bioplasmic channels, making the uh, physical body obedient and designing it. That means designing the physical body, fashioning it for the purpose which the eye remember. But the key word is it's designing it. Okay, so that's a quick correction, page 13. And 19, not a correction, but addition. Okay, so page 1920 is basically about the globule. So we wanted to, we didn't um, talk about it, right? Because we had to go. Um, this whole aspect. The physical elemental, blah, blah, blah. Uh, when you cut? Uh, okay, so, so it talks about, uh, <laughs> okay, so it says in brilliant sunshine, this vitality is constantly welling up of fresh and globules are generated in incredible numbers. But in cloudy weather, where it's, a great diminution in terms of number of globules formed and during the night the operation appears to be entirely suspended during the night therefore they may be said to be living upon the stock manufactured in the previous day and although it appears practically impossible that it should ever be ex entirely so stock evidently does run low all right so i think i already we, mentioned that yeah you mentioned that so it basically uh, yeah i didn't continue yeah. because we ran out of time so it says um basically the dependence of the vital globule on sunlight. Although the force that animates and energizes this globule comes from within. Remember we spoke about that? It comes from a different dimension, from uh, one of the, probably the channels. Uh, it's probably from within and it's different from light, obviously. For some reason, the amount of light has a direct correlation to its power of manifestation, all right? Um, another way, that may be considered is that we understand that the solar logos does not diminish the flow of prana. All right. It's just another way of looking at it from the point of view of the solar logos, the prana is flowing. It doesn't say, okay, now I'm going to reduce it or I'm increasing it. All right. It's radiated out continuously. So just like how clouds block sunlight, just as we know that silk blocks the flow of energy, there might be certain factors in the sky or in the ground or in certain areas or in this physical realm correlating with darkness. All right the darker it is, the more that whatever it is manifests, that block the flow of prana or inhibit the flow of prana. Because if prana is coming into the earth, there's something that's blocking it. The sun is coming there, the clouds cannot block, that means if the cloud blocks the light, the prana is also blocked. There's something off, if you wanna think about it, since it's a study session, we don't give you, and since it's open to public, we don't give you everything, you have to, you have to sort of think about it because um, if you see the sun's light is coming, then the cloud blocks it. The prana goes down. All right. Uh, is it the clouds that absorb prana? Is it directly correlated to exact sunlight or is it just our observation? So just like we know, there must be something in the air that's blocking the manifestation of this uh, prana on, on the earth. It's not only um, um, sun prana, it's also ground prana, right? So um, there might be certain factors because as far as I understand, since it says prana, it means ground prana as well. Not only, uh, you know, air prana. 
All right. So although I, I, I also I think from the theosophical, you know, according to what I've read and based on theosophical observation, during summer days when the sun is clear and strong, the particles are charged so much that in the nights, although the nights are, since the nights are also shorter, the amount of prana at night is not really in deficient because it's charged so much. So um, it could be due to the um, earth, it could be due to a lot of factors. And Masachu is saying the same thing uh, on page five, that it's observed that there's more prana during the daytime at night. Uh, prana reaches a very low level about three or four in the morning. Um, and page 2021, 20, you want to talk about um, the end? All right, L let me just add something to what um, Amit was just saying. So for me, the way I look at it is as prana healers, when we heal somebody, when there are what you call a congestion, yes, which means it's sometimes good energy and dirty energy, or sometimes a lack of it, you notice it does affect the physical organ of that particular uh, center that, it, that controls that organ. And so I, I think one is what he's saying, uh, when the earth is rotating, obviously the sun cannot shine on all sides. And so there is that reduction of prana, but also uh, like he mentioned, when there is clouds, somehow that doesn't allow the flow of prana to come through as easily. Why that does, we do not understand. But I, I somehow feel that's also related to our own physical body, uh, where they say um, you know, that we are also a representation of, of the, the, uh, the universe out there. And so if our nadis, if, if between two chakras, remember even the, the so-called planets are also chakras of the great being, the solar being. And so if there is a problem with one chakra, it does sometimes also affect the other. But within that chakra, the energies can also get affected. And uh, that could be what also happens to the planet Earth uh, when there is no sun. And somehow the sun is the one that gives life and, uh, and gives us vitality. And when that is, is, is kind of wailed out uh, or hidden or not seen, then it seems to affect us, not just us, uh, it actually affects even plants, it affects animals. And so uh, the entire uh, living, the, all the different kingdoms that are all living here does uh, require for some reason at this point, this life force to survive and without which uh, everything can get affected. Okay. Sorry, you were asking me something? No, something that came to my mind and it slipped out. Sorry. It just comes in and goes. Right. I think I already spoke about how you could see uh, this prana on, on a good sunny day and, and also related to master's uh, workshop in the basic course and also in the aircraft, right? Um, and so uh, it also talks about, um, are you talking about this, the course of work of the physical yeah, I think you finished all that just the last page ah, okay sorry just the last page I think you touched up on that as well yes I did I talk about the weather I connected yes, to the weather uh, to the day the okay further prana is poured forth not only on the physical plane but on all planes um, I mentioned this that prana doesn't exist only on this level but also exists on the emotional on the intellect and spiritual will be at their best under a clear sky and so affects all of us not just physically but emotionally and mentally also we feel better when the sun comes out and we're able to go out there and do work our kids love it when the, the sun is out um uh, I, I know many countries where they love to go on the beach and you know just stand and absorb more sun prana excess also can be a problem but anyway so the point is when the sun is out there all your bodies do get affected uh, in, on a positive note and it says um, it can also be added that even the colors of the etheric prana correspond to some extent to similar hues at the astral level. Hence, right feeling and clear thought react on the physical and assist the latter to assimilate prana and thus min maintain vigorous, uh, vigorous health. We thus find an interesting light thrown on the intimate connection between spiritual, mental, and emotional health and the health of the physical body. And are also reminded of the well-known saying of Lord Buddha, where he says that the first step to the road of Nirvana is a perfect physical body and physical health. Yes, and, and I think this is something we, we have mentioned many times. 
And so I repeat myself when I say that for all of us who want to physically evolve this lifetime, understanding these books are great, um, but we have to see to it that this body continues to stay healthy, to be able to use as a vehicle for us to progress physically, emotionally, mentally, and definitely spiritually. Because if the body falls sick, you definitely cannot do your meditations. You definitely cannot do your purifications effectively. And Master Chow says, if you're like this, you know, you can't do much in life, right? And so it's better to stay healthy. And so hopefully we can do more with this body staying physically fit. So whatever it is that you feel are blocks and hindrances, use the techniques of Grand Master Chua to overcome these limitations of laziness and hindrances that cause you not to take care of the physical form, right? Uh, sometimes there are old programs, there are you know, old egregos in our countries where uh, sometimes, for example, women uh, normally try to take care of everybody in the house and they, they kind of put themselves last. They don't eat necessarily the most nourishing or the best food. They give it away to, to the men or the kids and they kind of uh, take whatever is left. Sometimes it's not even enough for them. Sometimes they skip meals because there's no time. Um, they don't go exercise because they have to take care of certain other things. But I think we need to remember that if we have been created, there's a responsibility for all of us, not just to our family, but also to our higher soul. And so, and so the body... And so the body of this incarnated soul is very important to help manifest that destiny we have planned to fulfill this lifetime. Yes. Uh, and so I feel that um, trying to maintain right thoughts, right words, uh, right action, as uh, the Lord Buddha says, is one way to try and achieve physical health, actually health on all levels. And I think another is to use the techniques given by Grandmaster so that uh, we can actually purify each of these bodies because as it purifies and cleanses itself, it actually can draw more prana. It can, it can bring in more prana to sustain the life and the life force that is required for our existence. Yeah, so this is something that, uh, the, I think the key word in this is, uh, hence the right feeling, uh, that means positive emotions and clear thought, that means less inner noise. React on the physical, react on your um, physical functioning and assist the latter to assimilate prana and maintain vigorous health. This is one of the key things that all pranic healers would know. Many of the ailments are psychological in origins and it's part of what Master Chua, I haven't put the quote, it's what part of Master Chua calls the um, internal factors uh, behind the disease. Uh, <laughs> You know, medical doctors tend to focus more on external factors um, and uh, healers and uh, spiritual people tend to focus too much on internal factors. So both are important. Both are important. Here it's talking to you about probably the internal factors, right? So you yes. have the right feeling. You have clear thought. Your body is able to assimilate better. You, there's less, there's better communication between all three vehicles. Um, and uh, uh, the nervous system is also, the communication is good. Because the ethnic body is the bridge and the functionality of the body improves. Um, that being said, I was thinking about this whole prana thing. Another food for thought is basically, um, you see the prana is less, but Master Chua in the book Miracles of Prana Healing also says that if you have more uh, synthetic chi or, or uh, chi energy in your secondary navel chakra, uh, individuals which have more secondary uh, chi energy or you know, uh, secondary, you know, energy in their secondary navel chakra or synthetic key, the more they have, the, the better their bodies um, can absorb the prana. So the uh, absorption rate of prana is improved and is directly cor correlated to the amount of chi energy in your secondary navel chakra. Uh, so then it is then probably so that is a different, that's why on cloudy days, you have people who are regular meditators or regular yogis who don't get depressed, but people who are, uh, that's the observation, uh, people who are not spiritual or people who don't have enough secondary chi energy in their secondary navel chakra, they get depressed very uh, um, fast. Both are absorbing, this, both are in the same place. The amount of prana available is the same, but the absorption factor changes. So what happens to the prana, it's not, it's not that it becomes less, there is something more that probably happens to the prana, the quality of the prana reduces. 
Um, I, th I think I'd like to add one more thing here. Uh, what Master mentions uh, in our haptic yoga is that uh, even the Kundalini plays a part in the body's uh, ability to assimilate more subtle prana, right? So the quality and the quantity that we are able to take now when we do our meditation and there is the movement of also the other uh, prana, which we, uh, other energy that we talk about, the other force, which is the Kundalini, also helps uh, then help us assimilate more subtle prana. So there is the secondary navel chakra, which also helps. Uh, and there's the other force that we will talk about later um, in the chapters that come about the Kundalini as well. But just to relate it to Master Cho's uh, teachings. Okay, so um, here I think they're talking about the vitality globule, right? That becomes less, right? You're done with the whole thing? No, we just have these. So finish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yes. And so then it says uh, that the vitality globules, once charged, remain as a, a subatomic element and does not appear to be subject to any change or loss of force unless and until it is absorbed by some living creature. So, whether human, whether animal, whether plant, um, I, I guess even the uh, other forms, even mineral kingdom, once it's absorbed, it is, it is used. Right? Otherwise, it stays as it's, it, it doesn't get influenced by anything else. So it is there. Uh, it's just that uh, it, it tends to, uh, it tends to appear sometimes that, uh, you know, what happens to it when it's just hanging around, it just hangs around, right? But until and unless our bodies use it and assimilate it, then it changes. But otherwise, it's just there. It's like a storehouse that's all around. And until and unless we require it, it, it just remains where it is. And therefore, uh, we now will move into the uh, etheric double, that is the energy body uh, soon, and the energy centers. Okay. So about this, it's very technical. I think what they're trying to say personally is um, the vitality globule, once charged, it remains as a subatomic element. That means it doesn't go lower until it needs to be absorbed. But, you know, that does not mean that the quality or loss of force will not be there. The loss of force is definitely there. I don't know why the author has written that. We have observed this several times. What about prana in a stressful area compared to prana in a non-stressful area? Prana in downtown area compared to prana outside in the suburb area. This prana gets contaminated. Uh, the prana, the force changes. The quality of the force changes. The quality of its impact changes. Um, so definitely there is a change. Even with pollution. Even with pollution. For example, Master Choa, he was once, uh, I remember he was telling us this story, and he was uh, once uh, uh, attending a meeting in a downtown area, you know, a uh, work area. And uh, the person he was supposed to wait was about 15 minutes late. And he had this idea, why don't I, uh, he wanted to experiment with this breathing exercise and he's had 15 minutes, so he started doing this very uh, advanced breathing exercise uh, in that area while waiting for that person. And I think, I don't know for how long, but for quite some time, his body felt really, really sick because he says the quality of prana in that area was extremely poor. And since the breathing technique was advanced, it went deep, deep into his system. So to clean it out took some time, all right? So definitely there's, there's a change of prana, okay? So uh, I don't think that the force uh, is remaining the same. I think there's a change and there are external factors that apply on the force other than living organism. Um, but I think he's just talking about subatomic element. Maybe there's something that uh, maybe it remains on a subatomic element. Yes, but the quality of it changes rapidly. All right. So. And correct. And so I think a lot of times they tell us not to uh, meditate in places which are stressful, for example, in an airport or, um, you know, uh, where the energy could be dirty because Contamination is one, but stress, even though it's not necessarily uh, something that we are aware of, but if we can be sensitive in, enough to recognize the space where you want to do your meditation is also very important. And also where you want to do your breathing, even if it's not a meditation. Yeah, and also healing. Yeah, because I remember 14, 15 years ago, um, this gentleman, uh, this researcher, uh, his name is Dr. Joy Jones. He did a very interesting experiment. Uh, um, he took... Uh, uh, cells and he got a healer to heal those cells um, in a lab or in a place which was so so right normal place and he noted the survival rate of the cells I don't remember the details because this is like I said decades ago uh, but it was say, say it's 70 percent then he took the same the second batch of cells 
uh, cancer cells, or I forgot what type of cells they were. And he took it to a lab that was not used, uh, um, you know, for a long time. And he's not sensitive. And he says, you know, I was also feeling that it's a weird the place, right? And he got the same healer to do the same healing in the same uh, time. And what happened is, I think it's the same time. And what happened, what happened was the, the, the survival rate or the success rate went down by, I think, 30, 40%. So then based on these experiments, he concluded that the quality of prana in the place that you heal has a direct impact to the success of the healing. Um, so that is something that you need to uh, observe. Uh, and also, so that is, I think with that, we end the chapter. Yeah. And uh, you see, these are, this prana chapter, we've learned a lot actually in just 21 pages. So I suggest you maybe if you have time, if you're forgetting, you go through it. You really need to have like a sort of base knowledge because this is just one uh, aspect and one facet of the whole concept of prana. And there are many, many concepts of prana, but this is probably the facet that has to do with um, uh, etheric uh, double. So just to continue, it says air prana, you know, in the book, I think Miracle Supranaki Masuchua said air prana, solar prana, ground prana are made of white or general prana. White uh, air and ground pranas are called vitality globules in esoteric parlance because when they see clairvoyantly by a person, they appear as spheres or globules of light. So air and ground prana are vitality globules. What about solar prana? What is that? All right. And uh, some have more units and he says some have more units and then some have less units. They're not all made the same. Uh, what are the factors that create more units and less units? And then forget about all that. What about prana from the moon? We do full moon meditation. It affects us. Uh, supposedly when you do healing during the Vesa, the energy is so powerful that your healing is supposed to be much, much better. There is healing effect. But what about that prana? And how does that affect the vitality globules and how does that affect your physical body and how does that affect your assimilation, your rate of assimilation and the processing? So there are many more aspects to look at, but I think we should go to the third chapter. Uh, <laughs> um, we have to open that. Yeah. So um, hopefully this has made more sense uh, to you. There. Okay. I want to close the... Yeah, you can continue talking. We're still. Yes, yeah, so we're going to go to the next chapter. Chapter three is basically four centers. Uh, most simply put by Grandma Suchua, it's energy centers. Or as they say in Sanskrit, it's called chakram, or what we more easily refer to as chakras. Yes? Honestly, and so. I don't know what it's called chakrams. <laughs> yes, so chakram, chakras, basically the word literally means a wheel, right? Chakra that moves uh, and, and it kind of continues to rotate. And so since uh, the chakra looks something like that, the name given to it was uh, a force center or a chakram in Sanskrit. Now, the chakram that we're talking about in um, theosophy, they talk about them being on the surface of the energy body or the etheric double. And they say the etheric double is about um, an inch or so away from the outside of the skin. Yeah, so like the densest part. And so they say around there, clairvoyantly in those days, they could see this vertex, right? Like a whirlpool uh, created in, in front of uh, these points that they call um, four centers or, or, or chakras. And they say that this particular chakra that we're referring to in the energy body or the etheric double, they say uh, that everybody has it, right? So I, I guess when they did a clairvoyant investigation in those days, they noticed that every person around had these uh, chakrams or the energy centers. I'm just going to call them energy centers to make it simple for us. And so when they looked at these energy centers, they, they were circular, they were rotating. However, they realized depending on the evolution of that person, right? Uh, the size of the chakra changed. Yes. The rotation change um, and also the ability for it to, to glow or, or to, to kind of uh, go to another level where there's actually energy kind of emitting from it starts to change as a person evolves. And so they say here an, un, uh, an underdeveloped person has what is called a dull um, etheric uh, or an energy center compared to someone who is far more developed. And they say when a person is far more developed, the chakra starts to glow and pulsate, right? And for those uh, who are more underdeveloped, it, it just does the functioning of rotating, 
right? It's very dull looking. It has to rotate because it needs this, this energy or this force to continue to move through it. Otherwise, it cannot survive, right? But when you are more developed, then they're saying that it actually starts to glow. It pulsates. And in some people, it almost looks like mini uh, suns, yeah? Miniature suns glowing on, their, uh, on the surface of their body. And they say that uh, in those days, it, it varied from two inches in diameter, yes, and the more developed, probably six inches in diameter. We're talking about the size of the chakra. And so for me, when I look at this and then I come back to what Master Chua says, uh, he says something very similar in the books, right? In, in the basic book to start with. Um, however, the size of the inner aura is very, very different. Now, are they talking only about the inner aura here? I presume because they're saying it's literally at the, at the surface of the skin, closer to the surface of the skin. They're definitely not talking about the outer aura. Uh, which we refer to as the entire energy body. So the energy body it's for us. Sorry? The same thing, quadruple. Yeah. So you, you have um, what we call the inner aura. You have the health aura and we have the outer aura. All three combined is what you and I in pranic healing call the energy body, right? But here they seem to refer to exactly the double, which is the inner aura. And then the chakras on the surface of the inner aura. Now, interestingly, these chakras are not inside the inner aura, according to them, is just on the surface rotating. So they look at also the, the chakras of little babies. And here they say it's really, really tiny. Yeah, it's, it's really small on the baby and barely dull, uh, but sorry, very dull, not glowing much. And of course, it will be uh, rotating. Interestingly, I think today, in today's life, when we look at chakras of uh, our fellow human uh, brothers and sisters, we notice that the sizes do vary and, and a larger number of people have an average size that, have, that has already increased to about five inches. That's what Master Joe says. There is still uh, those who can still have it at two inches. Uh, but as you start to develop right now, the size can, can go up to even one meter. Yeah, so it, it, it really becomes quite big. And I think um, they mentioned once that, uh, I don't know if they mentioned or they were talking to us, that, uh, for example, in Master Chua's, this mini chakra, which is not even a major chakra for us, is his mini chakra is the size of some of our major chakras. Yes, so that tiny little... Uh, Much bigger, right? Yes, so for us, we, we can't even fathom what someone like the Lord Buddha's chakras would be like. Right. And so the point is not just their chakras, but their aura is so huge that when we go in or close to them, it affects us. Right. Positively. I don't know what happens to them, but definitely we feel a much better in their presence. And so um, just to add one more thing before I give it to Amit. And so they say there are two distinct functions for these. No, 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 no. Oh, not yet. OK. Fine. So basically looking at it, uh, if you can correlate this with what Master Choa has said in his books, it will help you kind of correlate. But remember, this was written about 100 years ago. And there have been a lot of changes. And Master's teachings are already uh, about 25 to 30 years. But still uh, seems to be more, uh, more in line with how we, the human race, are today. This is before, uh, just after Shall a while I just ago. do this for a bit? Stop. Uh, this is just before World War One, uh, just after World War One and uh, the flu, and um, going between World War Two. There was a lot of changes in evolution for men during that time. Uh, so here it says uh, the ethnic double were incense. So basically, uh, all it's saying is your body has chakras, and they're situated on the surface of the etheric double. And we already spoke about how the etheric double is quarter of an inch. We gave our point of view in the first chapter, if you remember. And these chakras uh, are on the surface of that etric double, which is quarter of an inch uh, beyond the body. And to clairvoyance, they seem like saucers or vort vortices or saucer-like depressions. And that's what Masachua says in his book, just to correlate what Sumi is saying. The human energy body is filled with big and small chakras or vortices of energy. These uh, vortices of energy correspond to agriculture. Um, now, the book says, the forces flowing through the chakrams being essential to the life of the etheric double. All right. This is obvious, okay, as we've seen the importance of life force in the previous two chapters, right? But why are the chakras themselves important? Because the writing here 
is a little bit misleading from my point of view um, because it's saying that the force flowing through the chakram is this force is essential to the life of the etheric double, right? That's what it's saying. But what is the purpose of the etheric double in the first place? And um, we, when we see the last chapter, the chakras themselves are important, not because it keeps the energy body alive. The, the chakras are actually one of the most vital parts of your energy body. And the reason they exist is the same reason as we have, as the same reason that we have an energy body is to keep the actual physical body alive. And of course, later we will also see it will also provide the shape and mold of the physical body. We, we actually saw that just now in the last chapter. But um, when you say the forces flowing through these chakras being essential to the life of the etheric body, I would suggest you change that to the forces flowing through these chakras being essential to the life of the physical body. All right, because that's what Master Chua says in his book, uh, Miracles for Pranic Healing. The energy body through the chakras or whirling energy center um, controls and is responsible for the proper function of the whole physical body and the different parts and organs. I don't think anywhere talks about the function of the etheric body. We'll talk about that in detail. And um, it says just as the visible physical body has vital and minor organs, uh, the energy body has major and minor chakras. So they are vital for their survival, yes. But actually the, the meaning of it is that it's vital for the survival of the physical body, all right? Because if you just know this teaching, this is good. Okay, it's, it, you know, chakras, essential life of the ethnic double. I mean, what are you going to do with that, with that knowledge? But if I tell you that, oh, chakras is essential for the life of your physical body, that changes the whole perspective entirely, okay? Now, the appearance of the chakras vary from person to person. Uh, Sumi's already spoken about all this. For normal people, it moves sl sluggishly. And in more developed people, the chakras glow and pulsate and are blazing. Okay? So if you read this, you have to read this very carefully. Um, they glow dully and the etheric particles move sluggishly. They are moving sluggishly, right? Just forming the vortex. All right? Necessary for the transmission force. And in uh, developed people, they pulse it, blazing and black. Okay, the key word is glow. What does it say? Move sluggishly and pulse it. This all corresponds to rotation. All right. So, in other words, it is not the rotation of the chakras, but actually the speed of rotation of the chakra that determines how powerful the chakra is. Okay, that's one of the major factors about telling you how powerful a person is not only the size, but actually the speed of rotation. Because if something is moving sluggishly, the speed of rotation is slow. If something is glowing rapidly, the speed uh, and pulsating, the speed of rotation is very, very high. Okay, so that's why Master Cho said in his book, um, when it's rotating, and of course it looks like mini sun, Master Cho actually said something very similar, and I need you to read the quote very carefully, because uh, there are other factors in it. <laughs> Okay, so he says, um, when rotating at a rapid rate, the chakra appears as a dazzling point of light. A dazzling point of light, 100 years ago, could be a miniature sun, all right? Miniature sun is a dazzling point of light for some people. Uh, when a spiritual aspirant is meditating, okay, spiritual and pranic energies are attracted to the head area. Anyway. <laughs> Nothing, you just left it like that. Yeah, yeah, it's not the... Okay, it's food for thought. <laughs> it's a study session, not that. Uh, anyway, now the chakras uh, vary in size from two inches to six inches. Now, maybe that was before, like Sumi was saying, because today, when Master Joe used to talk to us, not today, uh, at least 15 years back, um, two inches about the chakra size of a person who is uh, mentally retarded, okay? Um, mentally not... Uh, mentally challenged. Challenged, but, but retard is... You know, retard is used in a bad way today. Uh, what Masajua means is it's retarded growth, right? Underdeveloped. So, underdeveloped. So when it's underdeveloped, it has a direct correlation to the chakral size. And the average size at that time for was three to four inches, according to Masajua, and in the book, Advanced Frontier, and six would be for superior people, all right? 
and uh, six would be intelligentsia and all that stuff. That shows you, by the way, if you're looking at it very carefully, there's a direct correlation between the size of the chakras and a person's intelligence. Mentally challenged, retarded, or underdeveloped, two inches. Intelligentsia, six inches. Super developed, higher, higher. So that is, so although it's two meters, it says it's two meters for super, super developed. It's not really two meters. Remember we spoke about this uh, field. Um, two meters would be barely like what? six to 10 feet. But then if you scan some people's chakras, the aura of that, it's beyond the, when we were checking, it's beyond the banquet hall and beyond the hotel. So, so uh, obviously the chakra, he's talking about the actual size of the actual chakra, not the energy generated from the yeah, chakra. Yeah, the activated, the functional, those, those are words that we Okay, um, yeah, so the very inside to interest. Okay, functions. All right, so. So moving on to the function. So in the book, it basically talks about two functions. Uh, we're aware of this. So it says the etheric uh, chakra has two distinct uh, functions. The one is to absorb and distribute the prana. Yes, uh, that is the vitality globules to the etheric, to the etheric uh, body, which is through the nadis and the meridians, but also to the physical body. So remember, we, we already know this. We know that uh, chakras actually control vital organs. So through the chakras, they not only help the etheric body to, to survive and, and to stay healthy, but also our organs. And so uh, both of them are correlated, and we'll come to that a little later. But uh, this is one aspect to understand that uh, it does uh, allow the energy body and the physical body to stay healthy. And so it distributes the prana, absorbs it and distributes it. The second function uh, is the bringing down into the physical consciousness, yes, uh, whatever may be the quality that is corresponding in the astral level. And so we know this because um, if you are happy and enjoying yourself, you realize that that emotional state that you are in affects even your organs. Yes, it affects your vision, it affects um, your liver, it affects your, your lungs capacity. But at the same time, say for example, it's a simple thing like stress and the stress is beginning to affect your astral body, that, that stress alone can affect, for example, your vision, right? And you know this uh, because if you've been sitting on the computer the whole day trying to work towards a project, trying to do certain things, you'll notice by the evening, uh, the, the vision of the, you know, the screen starts to become blurry. And I remember this happened to me uh, when I was working late into the night, some nine something. And I realized suddenly I was wondering what's happening. I can't see the screen. You know, the words are not so clear. And uh, I said, okay, let's just do one thing. Let's clean out the solar plexus. I would just clean out the solar plexus and my vision would become clear as well. Yes. So um, stress affects uh, your, your, your system. And, and therefore they say that there has to be a very, very good connection, a, a good bridge between our astral body, our etheric body, remember it's the bridge, and the physical body. And so the, the quality of your chakra, yes, uh, is very important for this to happen because if our chakras are not functioning well, say for example, you're super drained because you've not been eating, there's not enough, even though you're doing breathing or whatever, and, and, and the body is feeling very, very weak. And someone asks you to do something, you know, suddenly they give you some work to do. You realize your brain also doesn't work well because the... the the amount of prana that we require, which we get, most of us get with our food, with the water, and of course, uh, breathing, is not sufficient for it to kind of help the brain to function effectively, right? And so coming back, so one is, yes, the chakra absorbs uh, the prana, distributes it, especially around itself and uh, towards the organ and the rest also to, to the rest of the energy body. And the second is that it has this ability to, to connect from the astral right through to the physical and uh, allows this, this uh, movement to happen. And they say that um, when we go to sleep, we normally move into the astral body. But even though we are awake in the astral world and we do things, when we come back, we do not have any recollection of what transpired because they say that uh, the memory is so dull or sometimes almost zero purely because the chakras are not healthy and well to be able to, to be a good bridge to allow that 
communication or the consciousness of whatever you experience in the astral world to come into the physical world, uh, into our physical body, and then of course transmit it to our brain. That doesn't happen. And so a, a chakra is, is an important uh, part of the bridging of these two respective bodies. Okay. So this whole page, uh, 22 and the whole of 23, let's just summarize it very, very simply, okay? Because it's so complicated that it's, uh, I'm confused, <laughs> right? So uh, from my point of view, um, the etheric chakras have two distinct functions. Obviously, the first one is to absorb and distribute prana or vitality to the etheric body. So it's basically the receiver of vitality globules um, and prana, different kinds of prana, uh, and transferring it to the uh, etheric body. So it's like the receiving mechanism. Uh, the second function is to bring down the physical consciousness wherever it may be, whatever it may be, the quality inherent in the corresponding astral center. Wow. It is the lack of this and so on and so forth. And many people are fully and okay. And memories. I hope you can hear him. He's just going blah, blah, blah. Okay, what a function are they basically talking about? Let's make it simple, right? Because Master Chua has explained this. Uh, the function that they're talking about is that some chakras, two functions. Number one is the receiver. Inputs, the, gets the prana and distributes it uh, to the etheric body. That's where the input, in, in, you know, how the prana entered. It's not the only one, by the way, but it's one of the major ones. In most normal people, it's the only ones, apart from the lungs. Um, then number two, uh, basically that some chakras have psychic faculties. That's it. <laughs> so they actually tell us Wait, in this uh, last line. So I'm, I'm just going to show you the quote by Master. Oh, okay. Uh, the major functions. Number one, they absorb, digest, distribute prana to the different parts of the body. Number two, the chakras control, energize, and are responsible for the proper function of the whole physical body and the different parts of the body. All right, that's mentioned here. Number three, you have to look at it very carefully. Some chakras are, um, are sites or centers for psychic faculties. Uh, action of certain chakras or uh, certain chakra energy centers may result in the development of certain faculties. For example, among the, um, among the easiest and safest chakra to activate is the hand chakras. So we will go into details in this. Just remember this for now, that the whole thing they're talking about, the whole astral from my point of view, and the, um, the connection between the astral and all of this is basically awakening the psychic faculties or a different type of functionality in each energy center corresponds to different psychic faculties. All right, we know that obviously the one function of the chakra is to absorb, but another uh, reason we can see, another word for function is what can you use the chakra for? How is it beneficial for the physical body? And how is it beneficial to you as a soul? One function, of course, keeping you alive as a receiver. Number two is using it as, so for example, when you're scanning, you're scanning astral energies, you're scanning different types of energies, but I cannot go into detail here, otherwise this will become like really like an hour on its own. How, like initially when you learn to scan, you can't scan, right? I mean, it's not, uh, you feel even in the class when we teach it sensitizing the hand technique some even that's just etheric uh, and some feel some don't feel then you start to feel more subtle energies then you go into astral then you go into mental then you go into different types of energies you, you learn to scan for stress energy you learn to scan for anger energy uh, for those of you who are hatic in the blue triangle you scan for I don't know what all types of energies right so your fingers and the bridge between the astral mental and uh, uh, and the etheric the chakras have to be, uh, have to be um, created and developed. And once you do that, that's one of the functions of the chakras. Certain chakras will help you smell energy. Certain chakras will help you feel energy. Certain chakras will help you see energy. Certain help you, and that's all that we have spoken about so far. So there, there are other things. Uh, till, till at one point, the entire etheric taste body, well. yeah, the entire etheric body, some chakras will help you taste energy. Uh, and till, till at one point, the entire uh, etheric body, not just the chakra, has become, in a become a receiving mechanism. So there are different facets and levels of truth for this. But just remember, they're talking about, uh, apart from what Sumi says, another level of truth is they're talking about how chakras have psychic faculties so, and how they can be developed. I think we should stop. Right. And also, I think uh, chakras, as Masacho says, uh, you know, when you do a meditation, it, it really gets activated. But the actual size of your chakra is rather small. But if you want to make it 
as big as it actually became during a meditation. That's when he says you need to develop the muscles of that particular chakra. And interestingly, that, that has to do with the next line, which I think there's a contradiction between what's written there and what we think. And, and so it's I'm <laughs> yeah, and so it's important to realize that, uh, for example, a person who sings, right, when she or he uses the throat chakra regularly, the size of this chakra, as we know in pranic healing, becomes much bigger than maybe the other chakras, because they've not only developed the chakra but the muscles in the chakra. And so, whether they have a throat problem or whatever, this chakra is still actually for them becomes really big. The same for a person who's a martial artist and they work on developing their navel, right? So their ability to sense, uh, you know, if someone comes close enough to their aura or to sense what the opponent is going to do with reference uh, to the next movement of the body and how to defend themselves, de it depends on the navel chakra. And so the navel chakra, again, for them is big, right? Not because they did a, a meditation or they did something else, but they've been working on it over and over and over again. And then therefore develops muscles. And a very simple one is where you find someone who has a very, who has very loving personality. If you scan their heart chakra, it's bigger than all the other chakras. Because innately, they've been practicing being loving to others and hopefully to themselves as well. About all that. It's next page, right? No, no, I'm just talking about chakras. Okay. And, and regularly, and so this chakra size also will become bigger. Yes, and so that way you can develop different uh, chakras. So the psychic faculty is there, uh, but there is also this aspect which you can work on, and that's where the virtues come into play, which we will talk about later. <coughs> but one okay. of the major ways of developing these chakras, by the way, is by using uh, safely using Kundalini energy to develop them. That's the one of the most powerful. Um, so that's why you can remember your dreams and everything like that that they're talking about. Right. Um, so anyway. And it says here, the last line, it says, when the etheric centers are fully developed, uh, there is full and continuous memory of astral experiences in the brain. Uh, so uh, Amit is right when he says that the Kundalini energy has to come up and operate. And uh, at the same time, then you would be conscious at all times, not only during dreams, but also during your meditation as to what is actually happening in the body. Yes. So we'll quickly go through questions. Um, we've barely done a bit, but there's a, uh, there's a little chunk left for uh, Wednesday. But we'll come back to this chapter. We'll finish it on Wednesday and then move on to the next chapter, which is the spleen chakra. So morning when we get up, we are fresh. Uh, Brahm Muratram is 4 a.m., which is the best time for studies, meditation, spiritual practice. Studies is mental prana, mental uh, work. Um, Meditation, spiritual energy, they're different things. They're not, they're not vitality globules. <coughs> Masa Choa, when it, sometimes his body would get sick. And maybe this is public, but it's really like, you know, um, affected. But if you scan the spiritual energy and other energies and the amount of Shakti Pats you can give, there's no comparison with a lot of people. We can't go into details of that. Let me think about it and get back to you, which is a two-line answer and see how we can answer it. It's different types of energy, basically. Uh, not vitality globules, right? One of the things that I, I'm trying to understand is I think when you wake up at four o'clock, which means you've already rested the body for at least four or eight hours prior to that, whether you're getting up to actually study for an exam uh, or for whatever other reason you're waking up at that point, which means that the physical body and the energy body has had enough time to recuperate itself yes to repair itself so that even the brain's capacity to then absorb understand becomes better and so these are basically what you call early birds and and they work very well at 4 a.m uh, the night owls however interestingly would probably be sleeping at 4 a.m or 3 a.m because they function very well in the night at, you know at, at that point and then they they prefer to sleep uh, in the wee hours of the morning into the morning and then wake up uh, later than early birds. So I think that is something that we need to look at. And so since the bodies are fresh and clean, um, re revitalize and re-energize, I think when you exercise and you do your breathing and you sit down for your meditation, your meditations would also probably be much better compared to when you've had a long day and maybe there was stress and other things, uh, taking all that towards the night and then meditating might be a little bit more difficult compared to a fresh uh, day. And, and plus, 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 according to the book, before 12 o'clock and after 12 o'clock, you remember that uh, it said that 
one hour before 12 is equivalent to many hours. Uh, two hours. Two hours. So if to you have to wake sleep. up at four, you'll sleep before 12, right? Obviously. <laughs> so Correct. the quality of prana you get is better. Okay. Um, so that, that is something not just written here, but even in Swami Rama's book, he says the same thing. He says, try to sleep before midnight much earlier because the sleep that you get before midnight, the quality of sleep, compared to post is, is completely different. That is for most people probably, but night owls may not agree and that's understandable. They're fine and they work very well. Okay. They work very well mentally, but physically we'll have to see. <laughs> no. uh, um, I'm not a night morning, owl. So uh, no. Morning when we get up, we are very fresh, even though there is less prana. Is less prana really balance our energy? Like I said, I've given you guys food to thought. What is the vitality globule is air and, and ground, but we'll talk about that. I didn't understand elementals works. As a, don't think of psychotherapy elementals. We'll, uh, elemental is coming up in the later chapters. We will look at that. Can someone attend the study if he doesn't have the book? Yes, you can attend. It's just easier if you have the book and you read the chapter or just read a few pages before you take it. So you get to understand from your own perspective, then you get additional perspectives. So your understanding is more rounded. Uh, Thank you, Nikita. She's put in the details of earlier uh, sessions that are already done. And also you can get the book online. For now, uh, if you are still under lockdown, please take the uh, online book and use it. However, when you have the opportunity to go out, please buy a book. Yeah, so. Um, I have two confusion. The prana comes from the sun. Again, it's generated within the atom. The prana comes from... Uh, so you need to just listen to the last chapter again. Uh, it does come from the sun and go into the atom. The, they're talking, the way they describe it can be a little bit confusing. Um, so there yes. are two types of prana we spoke about. Yeah, so the two, we're talking about, you have to you observe the two types. There's the life energy and then there is that, you know, holds it, holds the atom in place. Then there's the prana that infuses the uh, atom. Um, so if you just listen to the last one, we, we spoke about it and the nerve fluid passed through nerves. Yes, it is the nadis. I, I, I thought I explained it in the last uh, chapter. I call it the bioplasmic channels. I gave the quote from Master Chua's book and I request kindly make a session on the first one, yeah, a textbook. Oh, that wasn't recorded, I believe, right? Okay. First four chapters of the textbook of Theosophy. Um, yes, because we got into Vimeo only much later and so only from chapter five uh, is available. They don't have any... Uh, uh, option to put in earlier recordings on it only that which was recorded live that's it so sorry about that at this point at least um during the full moon gemini several chakras from my body minor and major moved out of my body and they started moving upwards towards brighter uh, light and beyond each of these chakras are like colorful lotus with long stems connected to the physical body and with these stems connected like whirling from it. This is a good experience. Yeah. Um, it is not the chakras. The soul is actually, uh, the bodies are inside the soul. So it's the soul that I understand is expanding. And the chakras that you saw might not be your own, but of different uh, uh, beings. And um, yeah. <laughs> you want to say anything? Um, Sometimes your chakras do look like cups that are trying to receive the energy. There's a so, holy grail within you. Correct. And so they, they do look like uh, they have they started up. to look upwards and uh, allow the energy to come in. So what you have um, experienced is, is amazing. And it's basically you, you hopefully at that point being a better vessel to receive this energy of the Gemini full moon into your system, into you, the incarnated soul. So is, does it specifically have some meaning on these special days? This is a deep topic. Maybe if we have time, we can cover it. Of course it does. Correct. These are the three uh, spiritual festivals, uh, starting with the Aries full moon, uh, which is um, like the highest point. So we have, uh, sorry, the Aries full moon being the first one, which is usually around the Easter uh, Sunday. And then the next one is the Buddha Purnima, which we call the Taurus full moon. And then you have the Gemini full moon. And so the uh, Taurus one is associated with Lord Buddha. And the Gemini full moon that just passed uh, is associated with the Lord Christ. Yes, his successor in, in due course. 
uh, is there a specific way to clean the astral mental body like we clean ether? We talk about it as the, as the author talks about it. And what is the alchemy center? There are several in your body, not yeah. one. <laughs> so depending on what type of energy you want to uh, work with, uh, work with. <laughs> um, we will see if it comes up, whatever comes up in the various chakras, we'll talk about it. And before sunrise, there are very few thoughts to distract us at 4 a.m. So we can achieve stillness faster. According to Ayurveda, it is a Vata time. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good observation, Deepa. That is a physical viewpoint. And that is, uh, so that just goes to show that there are always several factors involved. Um, you know, so sometimes... And the several bodies. <laughs> you have to understand, you know, from my point of view, the way I, I just saw an image. One time when I was meditating on this, 4 a.m. versus this, I saw an image of me, I, I could be wrong, uh, it could be my inner noise, of uh, me making all the masalas from scratch, uh, you know, sambar powder and getting the turmeric and crushing it and then making the dish and me just buying ready-made masala and making the dish. <laughs> he loves to what is better quality uh, can be debated on, but there are other factors involved. There are time factor, there is a difference in quality factor, there is there are so many factors involved. And if you ask most people, sure, you can just have the masala, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, uh, with the Everest or whatever brand you like, MDF or whatever, uh, that is also good. Or you make fresh pav bhaji masala or you buy MDF uh, or Everest pav bhaji masala. Uh, the, the point is there's not only one factor. So if you ask a purist, they say, no, no, you have to do it at this time. But there are different factors involved. Um, when you're looking at something. So what Deepa is talking about is different factors. There's the Ayurvedic factor, there's the uh, thought forms or the psychic radiatory field factor, uh, those factors. So um, just to remind all of us that Masachoa says it doesn't matter when you meditate. The point is to meditate regularly and preferably at the same time and in the same place. That is key to continuing, especially because you and I don't have the luxury of going into an ashram or out there in the Himalayas to do our regular spiritual practice. We have to live in this world, in a city, with family, uh, with work. And so he says, all you have to do is try and maintain a schedule. Do it every day, if possible, at the same time. So when you say a three double shapes the... Uh, okay, when... When we talked about uh, the flow of prana from etheric to astral to mental, in the, early. To astral in the early morning. So is the prana of the sun so subtle that it moves through all the vehicles? The prana of the sun is constant. I don't think it changes. It just emanates. It's there even right now in every particle. And that's why it's a little bit confusing because it's not like the prana of the sun. Obviously, the part, the part of the earth facing the sun will get more, uh, more prana, but doesn't mean the other part, the, the prana will not interpenetrate, it imprints everything. Because the earth is the being also. Yes, and, and I, the vitality globule, later on, I think if they talk about it or not, would probably be, you have to take into effect that the earth is a planetary being. Uh, and what you're talking about, vitality globules, could, could be the etheric body of the earth based on the physical permanent seed of the earth. And remember, uh, the yeah. planets are the, the chakras of the solar being, right? And so if that's the solar being through which we get our, uh, our life force, then the planets are part of it. So that's why it's, you can get lost in uh, <laughs> this type of book. So we have to look at what's practical. So like this next question is practical. When you say etheric double shapes the physical body, does it mean the shape of the physical body also? Yes. Uh, like fat or slim person, etc. If this is true, can we make fat person slim? Yes, that's the principle behind uh, pranic facelift and pranic body sculpting, pranic breast lift, pranic butt lift, or whatever lifts there are. And yeah, you can do that. You can manipulate the shape. I believe Masacho was telling a story. I don't know if it's true. Huh? Uh, of course, <laughs> if it comes to the teacher, but even he didn't know it was true. Uh, apparently, you see, in the old days, being very scrawny is not. Uh, you don't seem to get attention or. I don't know what Master was saying, but the key was this. He says that his teacher, Sri Yukteswar, just did something to him and his body became very big. <laughs> and then so it happened with another teacher as well. Someone did something to a disciple. I don't know, was it which, which guru did that to a disciple? And then the body became big uh, suddenly. So if you see uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, he, he, his body is big. Um, not because he went to America and started eating uh, <laughs> fries, but... Uh, 
apparently it was something that his teacher did to him. Uh, so people would recognize him for whatever reason. I don't know. Anyway, but yes, you can do it. Could you share the link? Yes, it's there already. Brands being pitched. Uh, yeah, uh, Everest is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the, the cooking, uh, he's the chef here, not me. All right, so um, can someone uh, attend, attend the, the study session even if yeah. they don't yeah. have the book? Yes, you can. Not a problem at all. But what we're saying is, uh, how do you pronounce his name? Rafka. Rafka. Um, okay. It's just that if you have the book, it's easier to refer and go back uh, based on what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can ask uh, someone to put in the link uh, for that. That would really help uh, those who need a book to get one at least to start off. Yeah. All right. Shall we end the session? We'll do the... Wow, Sriram, you've got a new look. Oh. Yes, I know him from Bangalore. So he's got the salt and pepper beer and stuff. We're all becoming salt. Yes, and nice to see all of you from uh, Kolkata, Banumati, and Punjab. I recognize some of the faces. Yes, Dr. Sagar, and uh, some of you. Sorry, I'm, I'm not aware of where you are, but uh, it's it's good to have all of you here. Yeah. So I uh, wanted to find out from you. You've been with us uh, for a couple of weeks now. Is the pace okay? If you could place a hand, the blue hand against your name, just for us to know, or just put a thumbs up, because not everyone are, yes, uh, sorry, names, you'll have to go like this, yeah, okay, Shivani, thank you. Uh, you're so okay, it's okay with the pace, right, because we're going slightly slow, but we're cross-referencing and trying to study thoroughly, at the same point, view it practically, and uh, the point of view is look at it from Master Chua's also point of view, because he, you know, a lot of this will correlate to his teaching so you can understand everything more deeper. I think we're doing five, four or five book study sessions. You're studying the mir uh, basic Miracle Supranical book again, the advanced book again, <laughs> some of other books as well. So it helps understand this and you can read more about it since you have the page numbers. Yeah. So oh, thank you. Good. Okay. So that's, that's most of them. Yeah. I'm presuming the other half have put their thumbs up. So that's why you're not placed there. No problem. Um, also, I think the, the later chapters, especially when we come to the chakras will hopefully be easier for us. Those of you who are pranic healers do keep the books next to you, you know, um, at least the chakra books or, or the basic and advanced book just for easier reference. So in case, uh, you know, we have missed out something, you can always add it. It might be helpful because it would be nice to have everyone um, join in. Yeah. Okay. So some of you have said, I think one or two about the Friday back-to-back -back session. Yeah, that is, Great. I mean, technically he had it after us. So yeah, so we, we, we will try we and will let you off. Early. We'll end it like at 7.15. Yeah, yeah, like we did last time. We try and No, last it. time we went over. We oh, went we went? Okay, sorry. This no, time we... definitely 7.10, <laughs> 7, 10, 7, 10, for sure. Like I will, I will switch it off. I mean, we will, we will close. We'll okay, we'll be talking with the spleen, so we can let it there. Luckily, the chapters are much shorter now. I was okay. I'm like, ah, yes, otherwise, they're long. Right. So, so yeah. we, we will get into that. And uh, on my Facebook page, I'll just mention the chapters. So if you're interested or other people are interested, they can at least come even for a chapter if they want and, and go. Not a problem. Yeah. So All right. So plan. shall we end with a prayer? Let's close our eyes. Connect down to your palate. Inhale and exhale. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Cho, Goksui, to Lord Maha Guruji, Mailing, to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, to Lord Christ, to Lord Yehoswa, Bar Miriam, to all the great teachers and the masters of Theosophy, to the great beings of light, knowledge, and wisdom, to our soul and divine self, we thank you all for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance, for your light, for your knowledge, for your wisdom, for your tremendous patience with us. Thank for blessing us with greater clarity and greater and deeper understanding of these priceless teachings. Help us to absorb and assimilate it so we may have a greater understanding of all these teachings of Theosophy and our beloved teacher, Grand Master Cho. Thank you and in full faith, with gratitude, respect and love, we thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Atma Namaste. Enjoy. Uh, we will see you your day weekday. after. <laughs> yes, your weekday. Monday. Monday has started. Lockdown is softening. Yes. Uh, please stay safe Excuses still. Excuses are now reducing. Lo I'm locked down. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. So please continue to remain safe. Uh, and uh, we will see you Wednesday at 6.30. Thank you. Take care. Atma Namaste. Uh -huh.